Welcome to today's webinar, Designing Roundabouts to Support Walkability and Smart Growth, hosted by the Maryland Department of Planning in association with the Smart Growth Network. My name is Michael Bayer. I'm the Manager of Infrastructure and Development at the Maryland Department of Planning and Project Manager for the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse. The Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse is a project of the Smart Growth Network, supported by the US EPA's Office of Community Revitalization and managed by the Maryland Department of Planning. In addition to hosting webinars, the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse has a website at smartgrowth.org that provides information on effective growth development and preservation practices. The Clearinghouse provides information to help local decision makers foster healthy, resilient, and economically vibrant communities. The Clearinghouse is also the virtual home of the Smart Growth Network, a nationally recognized coalition of leadership organizations that have formally endorsed the principles of Smart Growth. This webinar is one in a series of webinars produced by the Maryland Department of Planning on smart growth and planning topics available for viewing at smartgrowth.org. You can also find out about planning initiatives, planning tools, and educational opportunities in Maryland by visiting the Maryland Department of Planning's website at planning.maryland.gov. We are recording this webinar and will be posting it on our website under the Webinar Archives tab. We encourage you to visit the website and to subscribe to our e-newsletter to learn about our upcoming webinars. The views expressed by the speaker in this webinars, webinar are those of the speaker and not necessarily of the Maryland Department of Planning or the state of Maryland. Viewers of this live event are eligible to receive one and a half CM credits from the American Planning Association as well, and 1.5 CNUA CEU self-reported credits from the Congress for the New Urbanism. To log your AICP credits, Visit the American Planning Association's website at planning.org, log into your account, and search for the name of today's event, which is Designing Roundabouts to Support Walkability and Smart Growth. You can also search for event number 9249133. Today, our speaker is Dan Burden, the Director of Innovation and Inspiration for Blue Zones LLC, who has focused his career on helping the world get back on its feet. Dan is a nationally recognized expert on active transportation, livable and sustainable communities, complete streets, safe routes to school enhancements, and bicycle and pedestrian facilities and programs. By inspiring residents, policymakers, planners, and designers to change their built environments to accommodate people, Dan has helped to more than 3,800 communities during his more than 40 years of work in the built environment. In 2018, Plan Edison named him as one of the 100 most influential urbanists of all time. He has also earned two Lifetime Achievement Awards from the Association of Pedestrians and Bicycle Professionals and from the New Partners for Smart Growth. The League of American Bicyclists named Dan one of the 25 most significant leaders in bicycling for the past 100 years. Following his presentation, Dan will answer as many questions as time permits. You can always submit a question at any time by using the questions tool located on the control panel on the right side of your screen. And we will ask those of Dan once we get to the Q&A section of the program. Um, so today we were gonna do a quick poll to get started as we always do, which is just asking the folks in the audience uh, where you live and work. And you can see on your screen what the options are, West, Midwest, South, Mid-Atlantic, Northeast, and International. You can see we include Canada in the Midwest and Mexico in the South. You can also choose international if you are from outside the US. And we'll give you a few seconds to respond here. If you're having trouble responding, you may need to exit full screen mode and click on your choice. And we'll leave this up for just a little bit longer, give folks a chance to respond. As always, we have a very geographically diverse audience. So thank you for being with us today. We're happy to have Dan back with us. A couple more seconds here, we'll close it up. So the response here, 33% Mid-Atlantic Northeast, 23% in the South, 21% in the West, 20% in the Midwest, and 3% of our audience uh, says they're international. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dan Burden. Welcome, Dan. And once Dan takes over the screen, we'll have him unmute.
Okay. All right. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yeah. Yes. You just need to put it in uh, presentation mode. I will do that right now. Okay. There you go. Well, thank you. <laughs> I'm delighted to be able to put together this presentation. It's one that's uh, I've been interested in ever since around 1993, when I. Uh, was able to help inspire the first roundabout in Florida and saw the results. And uh, saw the results not just for, for uh, drivers, freight, all the regular users, but to see how they would benefit pedestrians. And uh, I'll go right into the presentation. Uh, and again, thank, thank uh, 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 this whole smart growth online uh, concept through Maryland. But I'm going to today uh, cover what I find are the most frequent questions that people ask and start with uh, dispelling a few myths about roundabouts and then get into the safety capacity. Uh, a rarely talked about is the economics of roundabouts, how they can help add to the value of land and then get into the parts, the types, and then how pedestrians, bicyclists, freight, buses, emergency responders all uh, can benefit when a roundabout properly designed. Uh, specifically talk a little bit about elderly drivers and elderly pedestrians, uh, further breakdown on schools, and then get into landscaping, and then using roundabouts for gateways and any other topics. Let's start with the myths. Uh, these are common uh, that uh, roundabouts are the same as circles. They are not, and I'll get into what the, some of the differences are very shortly. Uh, they have very different operations, very different size and scale. Uh, that they're bad for older drivers? No, they're actually the safest possible uh, type of intersection for older drivers because they slow everything down, they reduce the number of uh, conflicts that occur at a time to just one at a time at low speed. And uh, indeed, uh, those older drivers who are very familiar with them are among the first to ask for them. Uh, they take up too much land? No, they actually save a huge amount of land and we'll get that into that in the presentation. And uh, uh, very important to, to uh, get into the details. And this is really my prime reason for doing this session is to talk about uh, active transportation, how pedestrians and bicyclists uh, are well served when a roundabout is correctly designed. Um, so uh, let's uh, get into uh, the actual explanation of how roundabouts work. This is the first roundabout in the state of Washington. It was built around 1998, I believe, and uh, before the uh, uh, intersection was modified with a roundabout, it was a four-way stop. And there are three primary schools near this roundabout, and they would get queues of a mile in three of the four quadrants uh, as a result of that peaking of traffic. Now, the most anyone has ever seen, uh, now that the roundabout has taken control, of the intersection is a maybe six cars at a, at a in a queue, right? So what a difference. One of my favorite uh, series of roundabouts is in Naples, Florida. And uh, you can see here, these are conceptual uh, drawings, but then let's go to the actual as built. These are aerials of the uh, roundabouts after they opened. And I think you can see a lot of thought went into the, the pedestrian elements and into the bicycle elements. We'll get in close and look at uh, some of these details uh, as we get into the presentation. But uh, just fabulous what this has uh, been able to do for the city of Naples. I believe there are up to over eight roundabouts in Naples and they're among the best design. That was one of the questions is, can you uh, take us to some of the better design cities uh, for roundabouts. And Naples is clearly one that's done an extraordinary job of design. You see one of them up close here. 
obviously the pedestrian now, rather than having what had been uh, over 40 feet to cross, they only cross about 14 feet uh, and only one conflict, one possibility of a conflict and it's at low speed. So uh, the bicyclist is, is very well served with the roundabout, uh, but I'll get into that uh, as, as we go forward. The roundabout on the right is a protected bike lane uh, and it's uh, only conceptual at this point. The image on the left in Maui, uh, near the uh, University of Hawaii in Maui, wanted to help pedestrians across the street and their solution was a $14 million overpass. Uh, most overpasses simply are poorly conceived and they are a vast expense. You could build, rebuild this entire intersection for a portion of that money and then set the stage for uh, better land use development. And of course, again, getting down to, uh, as a single lane roundabout, um, pedestrians and bicyclists just having a very short distance to cross. So you can see the, the comparison here. So let's get into the first big topic, and that is uh, addressing both safety and capacity. It's pretty uh, clear that if you just have a four-way stopped intersection or a signalized intersection, that a, a driver and a pedestrian has to deal with multiple conflicts occurring all at once approximately eight for the driver, six conflicts for the pedestrian. And that's more than most humans are capable of dealing with. If you go to, on the right to the roundabout, uh, now we've taken the speeds down to a very reasonable speed, typically 15 to uh, 20 miles an hour. That's a very low speed and the yielding rate the desire of motors to yield to the pedestrian goes very high when you get the speeds down. Notice the uh, uh, fact that uh, for the pedestrian crossing on any leg, uh, it's now a very short distance. And then they have a island uh, that uh, breaks the direction of a conflict and now they can focus in the other direction. This is just amazing and uh, as has now been very well documented. Fatal crashes can go down uh, often as much as 90% and do. <laughs> Personal injuries, about 70%. And uh, all crashes, uh, 40 to 50%. And, and then they're minor crashes. They're, they're typically just side swiping type of crashes. So you can see it uh, blown up here. And um, this is one of the best used illustrations up regarding roundabouts. And we've designed this uh, illustrative work, oh, too many, in the uh, late 90s. So it's been around for a while. More recent, uh, we've upgraded the uh, presentation piece. Uh, this was all developed by Michael Walwork, one of the specialists in roundabouts in our country and uh, formerly in Australia. And you can see even uh, with a multiple lane roundabout that uh, we're able to drop the number of conflicts that occur at one time uh, down to a very minimal level. And when well-designed, uh, multiple lane roundabouts uh, can be very safe, but they have to have uh, some additional elements of design in order to keep the speeds at an appropriate level. So why is this important? First of all, uh, if, if we want a very high survival rate of a person outside of a car, either a bike or, or, or a pedestrian, the speeds need to be low. And so any crossing should strive for this. And uh, it's important to understand that, that uh, roundabouts uh, bring these speeds down naturally to these levels, when, again, when properly designed. and uh, not only is the accident uh, less severe in personal injury, but it's far less likely to happen at low speed. Now let's take a uh, example of a 
intersection, this one in Orange Beach, Alabama, uh, where we were doing some work and they told us that this road where they really wanted to turn into a village area, a, a really nice area, uh, that they were already uh, going to expand this, mostly for hurricane evacuation reasons. So I did this quick photomorph uh, and showed it to the audience. I said, is this really what you want? And <laughs> across the whole board, people said, no, uh, uh, we, we would never have a successful village if, if uh, we, we do this to ourselves. So I had my uh, photomorph specialist, Todd uh, Clements, uh, show what it could be uh, if we went to a roundabout instead. So think about what we would have done in the middle panel for pedestrians and what we're able to do in the lower section, again, getting down to only about 14 feet at a time and at low speeds. Uh, the uh, opportunity of a roundabout to do the work of the middle panel is that most roundabouts when properly designed uh, will handle 40 to 50% more uh, traffic per lane. So uh, this sets the stage for what I really wanna talk about in a moment, and that is road diets and roundabouts fit together. Keeping the number of lanes down if we just build intersections correctly, uh, builds the kind of a platform we want for walkability. Another challenge on uh, volume is the peaking of traffic. In Brighton, Michigan, uh, we studied this intersection and they had actually ordered the signals and they were sitting in the warehouse ready to, to install when I pointed out that we should give the roundabout uh, the first opportunity. And uh, they took it seriously and, and said, all right, Dan, we'll, we'll build the roundabout, uh, but here's our problem. The high school re releases all at once, and then we've got a nearby uh, uh, rail line that has long um, freight, freight cars, uh, trains, and uh, all those can be released at one time. And I said, uh, look, you're probably worried about the side street traffic getting in during those those uh, surges. And they said, yes. I said, okay, um, there will be many reasons why the side street traffic will get in and you won't have a, a big buildup. They built it and I've gone there on the peak hour, the peak day. <laughs> and the longest I waited on a side street to get in is about uh, one minute. and uh, so the question comes up, well, why does side street traffic get well served? Now, uh, I created an illustration to explain this, that if you just look at a conceptual roundabout in this case, uh, the, the, the uh, car, if it was a signal, has to wait, oh, 10 to 60 seconds ordinarily, right? And, and in some side streets, it's much longer than that. With a roundabout, the car uh, can get in even during peak hours uh, with that minimal delay. And uh, all they're having to do is wait for that gap. So let's take that car on the top. And so anytime a pedestrian crosses the street on multiple legs, that opens up a gap. So the more pedestrians, the better it is for letting side street traffic get into the cap. It, a gap. So uh, when a car exits, that opens up the gap. And when a car makes any kind of uh, turn, uh, is parking or unparking, if you happen to have parking. So all these reasons why the, the uh, gaps naturally occur and uh, allowing side street traffic to get in. I want to introduce the economic side of roundabouts, what the benefits are. So we go to, uh, again, the first roundabout in Florida, and I believe it was installed in 94 or 95, could have been as late as 96. There was a pedestrian fatality or some type of fatality every 18 months on this road in this uh, general area. So 
I was, at the time, the state bicycle pedestrian coordinator was being asked to help solve this problem. And uh, there were no modern roundabouts in Florida at the time. I took out a quarter, laid it on the plans, and I said, let's build the first roundabout, modern roundabout. And they, they agreed. And so this is what it looks like uh, just a few years later. It inspired all of Bradenton Beach to now reinvest in us downtown. Uh, I went back over 12 years later and talked to the chief of police and I, I said, how is your, your crash rate? And he said, Dan, we haven't had a, a recorded crash in these 12 years. So we went from a fatal about every 18 months to uh, not even had a, a reported crash. Uh, that's pretty remarkable, but it's the economic change that came to Bradenton Beach that I'm most uh, pleased with. Another town I've done a lot of work is University Place, Washington. You can see their old strip center, and they uh, now you can see it in 2020. And um, we have installed in University Place, I think we're up to about 12 roundabouts, just one street has seven. We'll look at that street in, in a moment. And uh, But I think the point is, if we're going to build villages, then we need to uh, be able to control the speed, the, handle the volumes, and uh, create the, the opportunities uh, for, for the success. They did not put a roundabout in at this specific, specific location, but they, they did. And one of our closing slides, I'll show what their overall plans have been. So now let's talk about uh, establishing a, a policy to uh, have a, a roundabout study for intersections before any other design. Why might that be important? If we are to max out the, the uh, number of vehicles we can handle uh, for a two lane road, we just have to have added turn lanes. So you can see the, the crossing time and the crossing width for a pedestrian at a, a, a street when we widen it, just to be able to handle that capacity. Uh, but now look down below for uh, virtually the same possible volume, we can get clear up to 25,000 vehicles per day. And we've actually exceeded that uh, with, with certain loading factors. Uh, so I think you can see again, rather than about 140 feet across on the top uh, for the pedestrian, and then all the way delays for signals and so on. Uh, down below, uh, again, it's only 14 feet uh, per leg, and uh, or per, per lane, and only one conflict at a time, and only one um, possible direction. Now let's go back to University Place. This is Steve Sugg, the city engineer at the time. Now he's the city manager. He is so proud of this roundabout. They used to get a crash about every uh, 16 months, a significant personal injury, and now they uh, get virtually none. This is, uh, again, uh, uh, very good history. And not only the capacity, but the safety is just amazing. They put seven roundabouts on this particular road when they rebuilt it. Another one that I'm quite proud of, many people uh, proposed uh, a road diet for this particular street. Uh, you can see all the lanes uh, in order to handle the capacity uh, back uh, in the before setting. And now I'm gonna move to the, uh, uh, the total rebuild. This is not a photomorph, this is the actual rebuild. You can uh, see how much they were able to take uh, a, a, away from the driving lanes in the upper section. Uh, go back just so you can see it again. Look at how wide that road was. And then uh, how easy it is now to cross that street. And now we'll move uh, one step further. Again, you can see the reinvestments that have occurred and uh, the added greening and uh, the cleansing of the air, all the things you get when you can uh, properly transform uh, way too much pavement into something that's, that's very uh, workable. 
One that I'm also proud of is uh, Albert Lee, Minnesota, uh, a Blue Zones community, one of the towns that our organization, Blue Zones, has influenced. The street that you see beyond the intersection was multiple lanes, uh, uh, four to five lanes, and they were gonna resurface, so we said, said look, you're only getting like eight or 10,000 cars. You don't need that number of lanes for that. Let's do a road diet. Take it down to uh, one lane in each direction. The state refused and um, over time though, the community was so well invested in, in its future that said, then don't touch it. Uh, well, you can't, as a state, you can't not touch a road you're responsible for. So finally, uh, they came around to the community and uh, you can see conceptually what we did. Now, all the road diet is in place and they've dropped their crashes 78%. Uh, the roundabout is yet to be funded and built, but the point is it will handle these volumes and bring the right scale and tie the old downtown uh, uh, into the new downtown that would extend on another one that i'm very proud of this was a, a, a 30 years discussion before they uh, came up with their solution uh, la jolla boulevard in uh, san diego area a town called bird rock used to have uh, speeds of 40 even 50 miles an hour and um, significant delays with their stop controls and their signals we took out all the signals and the stop control for about two and a half miles. And you can see the direct result. This is the same exact location. Uh, we went down to one lane in each direction. This road had to carry 23,000 cars. And today it still carries the 23,000 cars. It's actually gone up a thousand or, or two with single lane roundabouts. And again, think about what the pedestrian used to have to do and now uh, how simple it is to cross. Here's another uh, vision of the same street. Again, five lanes, 68 feet across, curb face to curb face. And this is the same street today. The speeds are dropped from 40 and even 50 miles an hour down to the average speed today is about 19 uh, throughout the entire corridor and uh, very high yield rates. What did this do economically? Well, uh, it really gave a huge boost to those businesses already there, but then new businesses moved in. Long's Pharmacy uh, says that they would not have come here had uh, they kept the old style intersections. And um, almost always when we see a whole chain of roundabouts in a, in a corridor, uh, we can see these kinds of investments. Brand new housing, uh, uh, and uh, brand new commercial development and significant uh, enhancements in, in the uh, retail sales. Now let's get into the parts. Uh, roundabouts have many parts and uh, so that we can cover the exceptions and uh, the ways that uh, uh, we can look at how to uh, uh, apply a roundabout to various areas. This is in uh, the Stanley Park area of Vancouver. Uh, notice all the elements. The key element uh, is the center island. Uh, and notice in this case, that's a raised area always. Uh, then a truck apron uh, for the oversized vehicles. When they uh, need to come through, they need to be accommodated. Uh, and so the edge of the truck apron, the outer edge, is what sets the deflection path for the motorist, but yet the big vehicle uh, uses the interior curb, uh, the one on the actual center island. You can see the placement of the, of the uh, uh, pedestrian crossing. And again, the channel island or splitter island, as it's often referred to. And notice the pedestrian bike bypass. Uh, let's go to another detail so that we can see the distinction between a modern roundabout in Clearwater, Florida. I believe there are up to 17 roundabouts now in Clearwater. 
and ag again, one of the best cities to study the correct design of roundabouts. Uh, uh, many great engineers have lent their craft to this. But look at behind the um, the uh, regular roundabout with the channelized islands. Uh, up in the center of the neighborhood, that is a mini circle, what we call a neighborhood mini circle. It doesn't have uh, all of the elements we see. It doesn't need them. Uh, the difference in cost between a roundabout, which uh, often comes in at over 150,000, sometimes as high as a million, uh, and then a, uh, a neighborhood mini roundabout, which can start somewhere around 5,000 and go on up to 25,000. So a huge difference in size, scale, operations, but they both perform well uh, in the same neighborhood as you can see here. Another uh, type of circle that gets confused for a roundabout is the circle, right? And uh, here we are uh, revamping a uh, mega circle. See the outer area, it almost looks like a racetrack. Uh, that is a circle. And then what we're doing is redesigning that with four roundabouts uh, that will move the traffic better, much safer, uh, and add to the 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 uh, capacity of the roundabout. So, looking at a a circle, one of the early historic circles, this one in uh, Sarasota, you can see the size, the scale, and uh, the uh, the uh, significance of this as, as uh, uh, a land use feature, right? And uh, we don't build circles anymore. They just take up far too much land, but some of them need to be uh, remanufactured for modern uh, uses of the street. So we're gonna take a closer look at this. And it's the St. Armand Circle. And again, it's very famous. But because of its original design, allowing uh, too much speed in certain locations and a low yielding rate to pedestrians, you can see how we're now modifying that uh, with the after treatment that you see on the right. So even circles, which are still uh, uh, a powerful tool, uh, they can be modified to become much friendlier for walking. We were given that specific assignment in in Buffalo uh, recently and uh, to take one of Olmstead's original designs for a circle and now with people driving much faster, much faster cars and, and totally different operations, this now needs to be modified to become pedestrian friendly. And in this particular case, because of the beauty of the center island, was a request to uh, design it so that pedestrians can get to that island. We we studied what the current uh, conditions are, found how unfriendly they are to walk in. Look at where they put the crossings, <laughs> way far back, and at a speed where the motors would take out the pedestrian in a heartbeat, either going in or coming out. And so this was the issue we uh, had to deal with. Uh, we did the redesign, and I don't know the final status, but it is uh, being considered for full funding and a total reconstruction. Uh, and in this case, uh, we will design it so that pedestrians could get to these, this beautiful historic island as part of the requirement given to us by the community. Another element that is often confused as, as a roundabout, but it's not. It's a, it's a neighborhood mini circle. You see one here. They can be any of a number of sizes uh, based on what, what the uh, neighborhood uh, seeks to achieve. But again, always bringing down the speed and always handling uh, the capacity. Now we go up in size. Uh, this is not a circle. It is a multiple lane roundabout. This one in Davidson, North Carolina, a near a freeway handles high, very high volumes of traffic. And uh, the side streets, you'll notice, are single lane, right? One lane, uh, the, the near lane is the same, uh, just off the side to the left of the tree. 
but but the big uh, volume uh, must be handled with two lanes. So here you see it with a pretty good sized truck apron and uh, a lot of buildings being built. Uh, uh, Davidson is, is another area uh, of great study. Uh, North Carolina DOT is building a lot of roundabouts now and many of them are two lane. And so they're learning a lot about how to perfect them for walking and bicycling as well as the volumes of traffic. Another popular design is the teardrop. Uh, I've heard them also referred to as barbells. You can kind of see that. And uh, a very uh, successful designs, again, at freeways uh, to handle the volumes and not have to use so much land in uh, uh, accessing the uh, freeway on and off uh, ramp conditions. I want to get in more specific to uh, one of the more powerful uh, types of treatment and, and show some added opportunity. We're just not taking, uh, as much as I've talked through neighborhood mini circles, uh, we just are so far not building enough. A mini circle is, again, very low price. Uh, it can be very attractive in a neighborhood. It replaces four way stops, uh, and changes them to yield streets. And in Seattle, where they have over 2,000, uh, they have brought down their neighborhood crashes 90%. Uh, They've been building them for over 30 years. This one in uh, Lake Oswego, uh, Oregon. Uh, again, very successful. And again, you can see how simple they are. They rarely have any other addition other than uh, just the circle itself. The circle does all the work. And again, um, very friendly to to uh, pedestrians. They bring down the speed, especially if done in a series, throughout the neighborhood to the levels that uh, honor uh, walking as, as a first priority. There was a variation of a neighborhood mini circle. This one I found in London. It's domed, uh, just a slight rise. Uh, here you can see they did add the channelized island uh, but uh, that was just done really as an added incentive for walking. It looks like the pedestrians are just choosing, uh, in this particular case, uh, not to go to the island itself. Uh, they've, they've got uh, the low speeds that they seek. One in our country that I really love, uh, Providence, Rhode Island. This is, again, domed. It's right in their downtown. Look how uh, they were able to keep the streets very narrow. And uh, the speed's really low. The cyclists, like the drivers, just um, go over the domed uh, circle in this case. And, and again, the drivers would do the same thing. But that dome effect and the difference in color, the size, the scale makes uh, downtown Providence a really successful place. Now moving into the, the uh, category of roundabout that is flat, right? Uh, this is uh, the the new style. Uh, this one in Jacksonville Beach, Florida. Uh, we'll go in and you, you can see it by scale. This road used to have far more lanes. And uh, why, why have a flat uh, uh, island? So it's not raised, but it's domed. It's, it's raised a little bit. This allows you to fit a roundabout in where you might otherwise not be able to get one in. Uh, and in this case, uh, large vehicles, oversized vehicles, which you're gonna see in a minute, are able to mount it and uh, make, make a left almost as though there was no circle there whatsoever. So uh, a very successful treatment. Again, look at the very low speed achieved. Even the, even the channelized island or the splitter island is only slightly raise in this case. Again, a little bit of detail. And then a very large one, this one in Kirkland, Washington. A little more uh, on the neighborhood mini circles. I wanted to show how they can be used in this case as a beautiful gateway. Uh, there's one at either end of this nice little commercial pocket in this neighborhood. Uh, again, Lake Oswego, uh, just a, a really beautiful, charming 
a, a, a intersection as opposed to a big four, four lane intersection, proper size, proper scale. But one reason that they're so inexpensive is, uh, well, obviously they don't impact drainage one iota. And uh, it's really a matter of putting a garden in the street. Uh, Missoula, Montana probably now has uh, over 10. Uh, they may, may have as many as 20 by now. Now let's get into uh, one of our user groups, the buses, fire response, and freight. So roundabouts and uh, many circles and uh, uh, some of the other variations we've just looked at are always designed for every size vehicle uh, with really rare exceptions where, where uh, the, there's a different reason for not uh, overly accommodating their needs. But again, notice the truck apron. Uh, in this case, not even being used. Uh, the freight uh, that you see moving here, for most roundabouts, the freight is just straight through. So the high volume street uh, poses no, no challenge or, or problem to a big uh, a vehicle. Now, if this vehicle is doing a U turn, or uh, say doing a right-hand turn or a, a, a left-hand turn, then they probably need that truck apron. But in most cases, they don't even use the truck apron. Now I'm gonna, uh, hopefully this works, uh, show you, <laughs> uh, again, one of the Naples roundabouts. Uh, this, this was uh, a uh, emergency responder coming in code three, going pretty darn fast. So here's an interesting point. That particular fire apparatus. Little had, explanation here. Oh, fire let me get past it. You don't need to hear me. But here's the funny thing. That uh, speed, if, if that was a signal and it was red, that uh, emergency responder by the law in all states would have to come to a, a near full stop or a full stop in order to proceed even though they're going in code three with sirens and, and lights flashing. So roundabouts actually are faster for emergency responders. Manitou Springs uh, uh, has also uh, designed their, their uh, roundabouts uh, to be mountable. But in this case, notice the uh, police and the fire go around it. They, they don't even go over it. They, they go to the left. I mean, again, they're coming in code three, right? With lights and sirens. They can do anything they darn well please. For freight, uh, in Hamburg, New York, where I believe we're up to five roundabouts, uh, we transformed all of the streets all at once through the main street uh, downtown. You can see the size of the truck apron. Michael Walwork uh, did this design. I notice it's in a historic district. They didn't have a lot of land to play with. And this is a major truck route through Western New York. So they had to accommodate the, the trucks or stick with the signal system or, or, or some other variety. Uh, but it works, it works beautiful. And uh, in fact, the uh, traffic throughout the downtown gets down to about 19 miles an hour and the truck, uh, truck Freight operators uh, say that they appreciate the fact that all the traffic is now moving their speed as they go through the entire town and they never need to stop. There are other things we do uh, for uh, large oversized vehicles. And in this case, in Fort Pierce, notice they've done a two-step curb uh, where, where they really needed to keep this nice and tight uh, Take a look at the deflection path. This is what the engineers work with. They need to set a deflection path to bring the regular driver down to the proper speed. But in this case, uh, they did the two-step curb to accommodate a higher speed, or a, I'm sorry, an, a, a large vehicle that would be making a right-hand turn. And, and again, it's fine for the regular vehicle, but for an oversized vehicle, they, they chose to do a two-step curb. Now, the, the real heart of my presentation, I wanted to cover pedestrians. We looked at this uh, number earlier, but now I want to get into the unique 
uh, qualities and needs of, first of all, elder pedestrians and elder drivers. Uh, we need to stay in motion if we're to maintain our health. And so throughout Florida and the town where I live, Port Townsend, Washington, as an example, uh, the population is much older on average, and we need to keep our people moving. So in Port Townsend, this is Port Townsend, we have three roundabouts, and we got six more that are coming. Uh, we train our engineers by blindfolding them and take them with a, with a site specialist and show them what the challenges are to an older uh, person, and, or in this case, a visual impaired person or a person uh, with mobility impairment. And through the course, we talk about what all the important elements are, uh, and that's worthy of its own presentation just to get into that. Uh, now let's get into some of the other benefits of pedestrians. So going back uh, to Bird Rock, uh, again, five lanes down to two lanes, 68 feet. Now think about how long you had to wait for the signal uh, if you were crossing. Uh, and then think about the fact that now, every time I've ever crossed, in uh, the, 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 the community, Bird Rock, I have never had to wait. As long as I make it clear that I'm wanting to cross the street, the motorists want to yield to me because they're going uh, 18 or 19 miles an hour, and sometimes as low as 15 when they go into the roundabout. So you can see uh, that the benefits are very clear. Some of the other things we do for, for uh, pedestrians and and again i wanted to tie this to the combining a road diet manitou springs used to be uh four lanes through town but then when they built the bypass of the town they were able to take it down to three so we uh notice uh just have the two regular lanes then we have a colorized uh mountable center lane you'll see uh some reasons why here in a minute uh so the pedestrian again only crosses in this case, maybe 12 feet until they're in a, a buffered area. And as opposed to what I believe before had been over uh, 50 feet. Here you see the, the uh, area uh, that we rebuilt this intersection. We couldn't get a regular roundabout in, uh, but uh, this was what the pedestrian had to deal with uh, before uh, we were able to bring the change. And now you can see the the uh, slightly domed uh, round roundabout and how well it works vastly in, enhanced the the uh, walkability of the entire downtown. Again, it was a combination of a road diet, but the road diet made possible uh, by addressing this intersection uh, with a roundabout. So pretty significant. Again, uh, the goal in a normal single lane. Uh, roundabout is to get the speeds typically in that range of 15 to 20. I drive roundabouts almost almost every day in my own town, and I find that the average speed of the motors going through is right at the 15 miles per hour. This is the goal. Uh, this, uh, you know, a motor could still go in at 23 or so, but they don't. Uh, uh, the rare motors will go in a little faster, but but the vast majority will come in at, at the, uh, the speed you see here. And uh, now the next element of, of uh, creating a great walking environment is where we put the, the actual crossing. One car length, uh, roughly 18 to 20 feet back from the circulating lane, right? The, the uh, lane in the roundabout. So the reason for doing that is this is going to be the lowest speed and it's going to be where the motors pays close attention uh, to to the pedestrian and it's both true on the entry leg and on the departure leg it's the lowest possible speeds so this is the correct position how does this handle uh capacity uh, again going back to hamburg is able to uh, uh go up in the air with the help of the fire service uh with their bucket truck. Uh, watch the pedestrian. 
about to cross the street. There's no vehicle coming out, so she enters. And then uh, she's well into her crossing. And notice what the third car back is doing. Well, you know, the two cars ahead of it aren't going to clear until maybe another five or 10 seconds. So he's holding back, waiting for the pedestrian. And notice the pedestrian is now uh, making the final elements of the crossing. And not a single car has been delayed. So again, for capacity reasons, uh, there are many reasons we put the the, the uh, pedestrian crossing where we do, but it really is the greatest benefit to the pedestrian and to the motors by doing that. We also uh, can uh, show the uh, way that we might take an entire uh, crossing. This this one is a photomorph. I, I work with my photomorphologist to build an ideal. Uh, intersection and in this case notice again what we've done we uh, have a yield before the crossing i would love to see that on every single uh, treatment and then uh, a, a second yield of course to go into the the roundabout itself notice uh, what we've now done for uh, exiting those bicyclists that do don't want to go through the roundabout uh, we'll talk more about bicyclists in a minute and then the ramp, uh, bringing them back into the uh, bike lane. Again, the, we need the yield at the circulating lane for the motorist and uh, a very simple crossing of this two lane roundabout actually. Uh, the single lane uh, is, uh, is for the side street. I always, uh, uh, when I work on walkability, I really want to see very wide crossings of intersections. Uh, my preference is no less than 12 feet of width, and I always to have the crossing island, as you see here, and uh, really support the ADA issues at every single crossing. Another tool that is being used and um, it's not approved yet by the manual and uniform traffic control devices. They kind of lag a decade or two sometimes, sadly, on what science proves. And uh, But there are many communities saying, heck with that. If, if we need some extra cautionary measures, we're going to apply them, and they do. And this, this one in Gig Harbor, uh, rectangular rapid flash beacons uh, have proven very solid as added uh, notification and uh, support for increasing yielding. They did the same in Maui. Uh, this person didn't even activate it. Uh, there are different ways to activate RRFBs. One is uh, to require the person to push the button to activate it. Notice the far one, uh, the pedestrian there has activated it. But uh, the other way to activate it would be to uh, have it be automated, just a detection system. It's rare, uh, but there are some cases where we've uh, also recommended that they do a raised crossing. This might be something you do on, say, a, a third entry point, uh, say, a continuous right turn lane, something like that. But again, it's a very powerful tool and it's available to enhance walkability. Another trait uh, I love, uh, Dan, Dan uh, in uh, Oh, I'm blanking out on his last name. Uh, Hartman uh, in Golden, Colorado did this uh, to further enhance. He uh, tricks the motors into thinking the road's narrower than it actually is. This road's actually 14 feet wide, curb to curb, but uh, visually it only appears to be eight feet wide and that further brings the motor speed down. Now let's talk about bicyclists. I love uh, emphasizing that there are two categories, mega, categories of bicyclists. The first is a, a experienced rider, but notice they're a very small percentage of all riders. And they, they'll take the lane uh, because they know we brought the speed of the motors down to their speed. And in many cases, the cyclist is actually being slowed down by the motors. But then there's a whole mega category that you see in the kind of the turquoise color. Uh, those uh, bicyclists who are uh, quite as confident 
and they would like to go around. So we build the systems for them to go around. And truly, uh, we we see this significant variation in the skill set and the confidence level of cyclists where we need to build for both systems to work. Uh, an older woman here feels very confident uh, in, in her country uh, and uh, doesn't feel a need to go around. The other issue with, with bicyclists is when they just go across the street that we want to make sure we put in all the right treatments so they properly uh, make a good search. And again, although it's going to be a low, very low speed, uh, let's make it easy for them to yield. I love this treatment. I haven't seen it at a roundabout yet, uh, but it's in Davis. And notice they force the bicyclist, in this case, or pedestrian, to look at traffic in both directions uh, before they, they make the crossing. And then, of course, they give them a median island. A treatment I've been uh, urging forever is also to put in the yield bars, right? You, you basically, when you see vehicles, you, you can put your hand. You don't have to come out of the clips or or do anything exotic you just simply hold on then you can give yourself an extra shove you can do this both on the edge and uh in in the medians and then do a z crossing the angle in the middle which again forces the cyclist to look squarely into the eyes the motors of the conflict that works both directions and these are becoming fairly routine or common you can see the the ramps in this case for Olympia, Washington, this is a 9% grade. So this particular lane uh, for the cyclists is very important. Uh, so the engineers have made it very easy to, to come off of the very wide multiple use path and then to use the climbing lane and uh, to re-enter when they get to the top. Schools, this, uh, they require special consideration um, Ken Sides is, is monitoring how many roundabouts we now have at schools. I believe, uh, Ken, uh, we're over 200 now. This is the first, Mount Pelier, Vermont. And it was so successful that the principals uh, from other states will come and study this one before building their own uh, roundabouts uh, in their own schools, in their own communities. One that I like, again, in Clearwater, one of the Go to places to study the most successful designs for roundabouts. You can see here the uh, uh, style treatment and how simple it is. It's, uh, another benefit is that motorists, say parents, after they've done their drop off, this gives them a good place to do a U turn to, to uh, end up going in the direction they want to go. Much safer, uh, again, very low speed and very low crossing uh, conflict points. These are just some that we've uh, uh, urged the design for. Honolulu, I think, is over three or four now at schools. And again, for a school crossing guard, so simple and so, so much safer to, to cross the students. In uh, Winter Garden, Florida, you can see here the uh, before they wanted to widen this road for a variety of reasons and and uh, uh, one of the advocates for not widening the road said we can build a roundabout here and keep the road to the right size the right scale and uh, this is essentially uh, although again this is a photomorph this is uh, what was able to be built instead of widening the road to four or five lanes landscaping rarely talked about but very important to roundabouts uh, if we do the right landscaping we can get the motors to start slowing down over 1000 feet out and to stay in a lower speed a thousand feet beyond the roundabout i am a strong advocate for proper landscaping these are just some of the tools that we would use uh, this one again is the first roundabout in the state of washington they're now over 400. One of the issues that is always raised about uh, landscaping is, well, the motors wouldn't be able to see across. We don't want them to see across. <laughs> we want them to see what's so attractive and to slow down. And uh, so when landscaping helps do that, 
uh, that's great. All the motorist needs to see to safely enter any roundabout is a, a, about three to four seconds to their left. That's all they need for information. Anything else is extraneous and, and maybe um, would, would render the roundabout less effective as they sit waiting for a car that's many seconds out. Uh, so uh, very important to, to use landscaping appropriately. We can do that with mini circles as well. Uh, this is a beautiful treatment again in Lake Oswego. Marble Cliff, which is in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, again, you don't need to see a cross. And again, good landscaping further slows the motors down, makes the roundabout even safer than if you just uh, leave it fairly blank. Uh, this is a mini circle. We can also, with landscaping, uh, use different materials to emphasize uh, what we're trying to get the motors to to appreciate and understand this one in West Palm Beach. Fort Pierce, another uh, city, uh, mother load of roundabouts in Fort Pierce. Combination of work by Michael Walwork and uh, uh, Ramon Trias, the city planner there. These are all Fort Pierce. I'm nearing the end now, but I wanted to also point out that roundabouts can be used as gateways into the city uh, or into a brand new neighborhood. They really make a statement uh, much better, uh, more complete than any other type of intersection. And again, uh, the value of thinking of all the ways that roundabouts uh, and, and other types of circles, this is a mini circle, can define say in this case the rural character of this neighborhood and then finally i'm going to close out with a couple of key points this is an intersection uh, that you see down below uh, outlined in red that three intersections there can take as long as 20 minutes to get through uh, just because they're near capacity but what if a new development comes in and with the aid of roundabouts, uh, help a motors bypass getting down to the intersection completely. We could take as much as 20% of the total volume of the traffic off of uh, that lower road. And then finally, uh, I mentioned earlier that I get to this point, University Place Washington, you can see where they went from the strip to the village uh, truly now they're downtown, uh, they have over eight roundabouts proposed long-term for this area. It's the road going through the middle, Bridgeport uh, Way, uh, uh, still has no roundabouts, uh, but it's it's been rebuilt in order one day when they're ready for it to be able to replace the signal intersection with roundabouts. But they've all already built the lowest bypass, the one you see in the upper image, the um, lowest end of that upper image, that roundabout has been built. And so they, they're building an easy way to get into where the new strip center has been converted to the village. But um, the planning has been incredible for this. And uh, it's, again, increased the value of that land about 800%. <laughs> it's amazing. Well, I've enjoyed uh, giving this presentation, and I'm going to turn it back uh, to uh, uh, to Michael and uh, allow any questions. I hope I've uh, allowed enough time for all the questions to be asked. So, with that, is there anything I need to do? Well, th thanks, Dan. We'll have you turn your camera on, and uh, thanks to everybody who submitted questions. I'm afraid we're probably not going to have time for them all. Um, but we'll get through as many as we can. How about that? And then maybe if you can go over five minutes or so, Dan, we'll continue oh, yeah. till we run, run out of time. <laughs> Great, thanks. Okay, excellent. Well, well, we'll just start here and keep going through here. So a question from Shannon McDowell who asks, what are the maximum traffic volumes for a roundabout to be considered? Sure. Well, uh, we're now proven that we can get clear up to 25,000 vehicles 
and keep to a two lane road, right? Or a single lane roundabout. Uh, the loading factors uh, uh, will we'll determine that. And uh, there's some cases where we know we can get up to 30,000, uh, but it's all got to be a balanced load that, that, that works. Uh, so those would be the upper ranges for a single. Then uh, a two lane roundabout can get way up into the mid 30s. And I think uh, we're, we're proving that we can, again, based on the loading, uh, clear up into the 40,000. Uh, and then with uh, dedicated right turn lanes beyond that uh, can even go, go higher. Sarasota, Florida has uh, challenged itself to put in uh, two lane roundabouts on some very, very high volume roads. So single lane, uh, easily we can get up to 20K uh, and possibly as high as 30,000 based on the loading factors. And by the way, the engineers don't ever want to make a mistake. So they they run really good modeling uh, that proves uh, what the levels of service are going to be before anything ever gets built. So uh, yeah, a good engineer will will guarantee that you won't fail. But too often uh, we're seeing uh, like we did with Brighton, Michigan, that people turn it down uh, on on some assumption that it won't work, but uh, we were able to prove that even with peak loading, we can handle uh, the side street traffic and so on. So great question, yeah. Great, thanks, Dan. So we had uh, several questions related to um, what to do about roundabouts in hilly areas and whether there are any particular uh, considerations that need to take place for that. Yeah, well, uh, yes, uh, hills, another issue, uh, but we've been building uh, some roundabouts with 9% uh, percent grade. That is a huge grade. And uh, just keep in mind that if you're using a standard intersection of a four-way stop or signals, uh, you're still dealing with that kind of grade. We typically bench it out in order to, to deal with it, but Round, roundabouts, because they bring the speeds down so much lower, they're actually safer when you're dealing with, with significant grade. And again, our engineers know how to deal with the grade at roundabouts, so not, not a big issue. Okay, thank you. Um, here's a question that you might not get too often from Benjamin Andrea, who asks, Dan, what is your least favorite roundabout? Oh, gee, I have many. Uh, there are so many bad roundabouts that were built. Uh, people think they, you know, uh, can just study a few manuals and then they can do it correctly. Uh, I don't want to cite a specific location, but some of the earlier ones that were built, I have to now be rebuilt. And uh, some of our better roundabout engineers <laughs> now make a living going in and, and correcting for the gross errors that that got made. Any single lane roundabout in an urban area that has speeds that are consistently above 20 is a badly designed and built roundabout. And uh, again, uh, there's a huge market for those engineers that will go in and correct for the mistakes of someone who's just going for speed and, um, and end up building a bad name for roundabouts. Uh, I will mention one county that did a very bad job, Oakland County, and I won't mention the state, so they're still protected. They gave a very bad name to roundabouts uh, because they didn't build for for ADA features, and uh, they made so many mistakes. So there are entire counties that have done it wrong. Hopefully, they've corrected their approach, but I once, I know I will mention one specific one. I was uh, called in uh, in my hometown, my birth town, Columbus, Ohio, in the Gahanna area, they had built a two lane roundabout. So a blind woman with her blind dog and uh, uh, very clearly blind, uh, she and I tried to cross through this roundabout, all four legs in Gahanna, two lane roundabout. I could not get a single motorist to yield to us. It just, they designed it for such exotic speeds. So again, uh, there are some really bad ones out there and I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll, we'll all learn from those, those mistakes and stop. 
stop that kind of design. Yeah. Great, thanks, Dan. Next question here is from Fred Mana, who asks, uh, do roundabouts complement or conflict with reverse angle parking in business districts? <laughs> well, you know, with almost every roundabout uh, I've built, including the ones in um, uh, San Diego, the, the Bird Rock roundabout, we proposed back in angle parking for that. They just weren't ready for it. And so they use uh, front end angled parking. And, and then again, that's with 23,000 cars a day, a single lane in each direction, right? And it works. It works beautifully because they had the width to play with. But boy, it would have been such a better design if they'd used back and angled parking. I don't know of any roundabouts yet with back and angled parking. But it's the natural solution because the speeds are low and it, it, it's the safest and most preferred way to park vehicles back in angle. Yeah. But no, I, I don't know of any examples built. But we always propose it. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. So we also got several questions regarding some of the challenges, I guess, uh, for snow plowing through roundabouts. Is there something that um, you can design or factor in? to deal with yes. that? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Uh, the main thing is, is it's a operation that uh, deep snow country, they've, they've perfected, right? I'm, uh, uh, snow plow operators and public works directors work so closely in alignment that they figure out what new approach to take. The good thing about roundabouts and snow is that you never need to stop. With a conventional intersection, you got to stop and then pick up that load and and push it to the side or whatever once you can gain regain momentum. But with a roundabout, um, obvious, uh, you you just keep keep that motion. And uh, uh, I I've never watched it in operation, but but uh, my good friends up in Buffalo tell me that uh, it, it's an advantage. Uh, to to have roundabouts because the snowplow operators never need to pick up that load and start from scratch again. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Um, next question here is: uh, Should the neighborhood roundabouts be complemented by a reduction in speed limits in residential areas, especially on wide street cross sections? I think so. Um, uh, again, Seattle, uh, which uh, is building brand new neighbors now where, where their street width is 24 feet curb to curb uh, with parking on both sides, uh, what we call yield streets. Uh, they're using the mini circles to great effect. And uh, it's the combination that, that really builds for, for the safest neighborhoods. I'm a strong proponent that neighborhood streets, local streets, should uh, operate with 20 miles an hour. 20 is plenty. Uh, most European nations are way ahead of us in the US. And why we still have to insist on 25 or even 30 miles an hour in local streets, it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, so yes, uh, narrower streets uh, with mini circles, uh, which by the way can work with as narrow streets as 22 foot wide by 22 foot wide. Uh, they've got formulas for for putting in mini circles for every single uh, design. Uh, so yes, they're they're a great complement to one another. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Next question here is from Susanna Troner, who asks, um, "How can we help residents learn how to use roundabouts so that they do not oppose them?" We're dealing with that in. Uh, cities throughout the country. I just came from Brevard, North Carolina, where that was the big thing. Uh, they're building 10 roundabouts in a population where they're going to be on the same par with Carmel, Indiana, uh, per capita, right? And uh, But most of theirs are big ones. They're, they're going to be two-lane. Uh, many of them are going to be two-lane roundabouts. So we worked with the uh, the elder community had over 130 people take part in a webinar we did. Uh, in fact, the birthplace for this presentation was was that particular uh, presentation. And there are so many really good 
uh, short videos that are now out that uh, one can download from the from the internet uh, uh, from the National Insurance Institutes and Federal Highway Administration and many really good videos now that help explain how to drive through roundabouts. Uh, different states have them for their own drivers, uh, so that they that authentic. I think Washington does. Uh, so yeah, uh, the visual format is probably the very best. Uh, even organizations like AARP now have documents out to teach elder drivers how to to uh, use roundabouts. Stan, here's one from David Hutchinson who says, can you talk a little bit more about the economic benefits of roundabouts and any best examples that come to mind? Can roundabouts help address equitable access to transportation in economically challenged areas? And if so, how would you suggest they be utilized? Yeah, well, the, the number one thing about a roundabout is if we can do that in conjunction with road diets or not have to supersize a road, then we're increasing that land value in an astronomic level, right? Again, that 800% figure that uh, we, we showed with the University Place Washington is just an example. Keeping um, the uh, right speed, the right scale uh, to a roundabout uh, and, and the road diet that goes along with that um there are so many good examples now where after the roundabouts went in you can see the rise or the increase in land value another good example by the way is um, um raleigh north carolina uh we did a conversion street road diet right there with the with the campus town gown it used to be one of the least safe streets in the in the whole state uh and now with the road diet and the, I, I think there are up to seven roundabouts, they were able to, to uh, set the stage. And I think it's now over half a billion dollars of new development that's come in. Uh, had that still been that four, four lane road, uh, it, it would have suppressed the economic uh, recovery. So that's a great example. Uh, um, by the way there, uh, the neighborhoods had to accept a little bit of traffic because that was at, at the higher volumes for for single lane roundabouts, and so the uh, neighborhoods agreed they they just wanted a better overall village to be able to come down to it. And boy, did it ever make the difference! Blanking out temporarily on the name of the road, Hillsboro Hillsboro Street in Raleigh, North Carolina, the town gown connector. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, next question here uh, references something you talked about, which is uh, seeing through to the other side is a sticking point for many proposed roundabouts. Where can one find data supporting what you reported? I don't think the, the information is out there as well as it needs to be. Uh, I've checked in before this presentation with uh, uh, some of my favorite engineers in the country. And they say there's no data that says that uh, the, the the visual aspect seen across w would have any any difference at all. So probably that's a good topic for the Transportation Research Board to take up uh, in more depth. I've I've seen some very light things, but they weren't weren't that definitive. So, but clearly no practicing engineer that builds roundabouts. Uh, that I know of has any problems with with not being able to see across. The other issue that comes up with landscaping, and I'm a strong proponent of this, is you, is you get a, either a double canopy or a triple canopy, if you can use a median, and then uh, trees or other raised features in the roundabout. Uh, that's going to bring the speeds down throughout the entire corridor. So you're reducing the overall potential for a crash if if you do proper landscaping yes someday a motorist might go into the roundabout and do harm but that's the rarity that's what you're trying to prevent and good landscaping and the, the proper use of trees is is a, 
uh, going to dampen the possibility of a crash. Uh, we we need in engineers and public works directors and city managers to all work in agreement that they they need to do what is proven most safe. And if we do, haven't done the research, and I think we we have when it comes to trees, but when when it comes to applying them to center islands and so on, perhaps we can do more uh, to to get these concepts across. The worst possible thing is to not use landscaping and have a motorist come into any intersection of any type at too high of a speed and then, then end up uh, uh, with a result in a crash, loss of control for whatever reason. So I'm a very strong proponent of doing that research, but if, if it doesn't exist in enough depth yet, we need to, to do that. Thanks, Dan. Next question here is uh, from Ian Friedland who asks, what would you recommend regarding education for drivers and bike riders new to roundabouts, especially for seasonal communities, for example, beach communities, ski resorts, where a majority of drivers and bikers are not local? Yeah, well, I'll use my own town as an example. Port Townsend, Washington is one of the real hot spots for tourism. And we already have three. Uh, again, we're gonna probably build five more. Um, the, the, several of them are in design. I saw the sur survey crews out yesterday. Um, those who don't don't have the experience with roundabouts are going to enter a little more slowly. Uh, they're going to be too cautious, and in a way, that's a good thing. Uh, so we we lose a little capacity if we're in a tourist town uh, because people who might come from another part of the state or region and not uh, be as comfortable, that's fine. We can l use lose a few seconds per driver uh, because that tourism is important to us. And, and it, it's just a matter of another decade or so where virtually everyone's gonna be well informed about how to use roundabouts. One of, one of the fun things to do uh, on the University of California Davis where they have dozens of uh, bicycle roundabouts is for the uh, students uh, to go uh, and surround around a, a, a intersection where there's a roundabout and just watch all the crazy students who don't understand this is their first uh, semester. And they just have the greatest fun watching people learn the skills. But one or two days later, they know how to handle it. So the fun is over in a day or two, so. Thanks, Dan. Um, next one here is from Mike DeSantis, who says, why do we see so many 14-foot curb-to-curb dimensions? The lane reductions are great, but this uh, distance seems excessive. I've always uh, listened to my favorite engineers, and they tell me because of the deflection path and the setup that 14 is kind of a magic number. Um, I've seen uh, entries that are less, uh, very well regulated. Um, but I'll, I'll go with my engineers on why they prefer 14 as, as their standard. And again, I think it's just how they set up the, the movement uh, uh, queuing in into the, to the roundabout. Now the roundabout itself, the circulating lane does need to be more than 12 feet. Um, again, it's in a curve and uh, there are a number of reasons the engineers prefer a, a, a wider Angle. I'm not an engineer, and I hope everyone knows that. Uh, so I, I listen to my engineers, uh, and I try to get schooled in how things work and so on. But uh, uh, in in the roundabout, the circulating does lane does need to be wider than 12, and then uh, coming in uh, the actual crossing for the pedestrian, 14 seems to be a good workable number. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Our next one here is from Andrew McGee, who says, have you seen a successful high traffic three lane roundabout, a full three lanes in all directions in the United States? A proposed three lane roundabout in my area was changed to a single point interchange due to fears the increased pavement width would lead to too high speed and lane cutting. And if not, do you think that's probably the functional limit for the US? Three lanes. Uh... Well, Sarasota, Florida may be a good place to study. They've been building uh, many mega lane 
intersections, and I've seen, uh, almost pulled it into to this presentation, but but there was too much to cover. Uh, they've got some three lanes that they've now marked out as two lanes. They're ready to expand to three when they need to, but they don't need them right now. I would, by the way, uh, really caution communities not to build more lanes than, than you need, but uh, yeah, I, I'm sure a three lane would be the upper, upper uh, area that we'd want to deal with. And again, uh, in my closing image or two, I tried to show that we need to put more thought into the system so that we take pressure off of a particular major road so that we just don't have to keep widening and widening in, uh, and so on. So look more at the system to where we don't have to do something that, that foolhardy. Thanks, Dan. Uh, we'll ask a few more and wrap if we can go a couple minutes over. Given all the volume of questions, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, excellent. Okay, next one is uh, from Maria Pirelli, who's asking: uh, Can roundabouts be designed with the center island as a type of re retention pond? South Florida Ooh. has has South Florida has <laughs> challenges with traffic safety and flooding. It would be a great to see water-loving trees in the center island to add beauty and function. But I did hear you mention the center island is usually elevated, I presume, for added safety. Well, it is. And and uh, to the other thing about a roundabout, and I didn't mention this, is we uh, cantilever or, or we, um, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? We, uh, you know, on a road that we're trying to increase the speeds, we we will will angle the road so that the motor feels comfortable going at high speed. Roundabouts are just the opposite. We purposely put in a reverse camber, I think is the word I'm looking for, uh, to slow the motors down. So if you go into a roundabout too fast, you're gonna feel the discomfort. So uh, now, with that idea in mind, would there be a way to pipe the water in like we do with rain gardens? Um, I, th I think that's worthy of, of looking at. I think it would be a beautiful thing to do. We do know not to make the the center island uh, too attractive. Clearwater, Florida built a mega size roundabout that that uh, worked really well, but it had a water fountain in it, <laughs> and it sprayed motors on windy days. And uh, uh, they finally took it out at a great cost, uh, removing that that. Uh, but would would some type of a retention area work? I'd like to challenge my engineers to think about that. Okay, thanks, Dan. Um, next question from Danny Shapel, who asks, are there any special modifications to add to a roundabout to make it friendlier for the blind? Oh, many. And uh, I tried to, as, as I talked through pedestrians, uh, just discuss the, the criticality, of getting the speeds low. That's number one. And uh, then have really good sight lines. That's easy to do, but but just really emphasize that. And uh, with those in combination, we're hitting the big elements. We're working with our own um, uh, community here in Port Townsend. And when we did the training for our engineers on how to do this, uh, there were a lot of issues uh, covered. I've got a short list of what those are, and I'd be really happy to share that. Again, uh, most important thing, get the speeds low, get the visibility of the pedestrian really high, and uh, keep that crossing distance reasonable. And uh, I think those are the, the key things. Uh, by the way, the Montpelier, Vermont, their, their first uh, roundabout in the state and the one at the school I showed, uh, they have a blind person there that could never really navigate well in the community back before that roundabout got built. And uh, the, the word is that she now finds it very easy to get through her community as a blind person. And I believe in her case, she is 100% blind. Uh, 80, maybe slightly more percent of people are blind have some vision. Uh, but it's important again to get those speeds low and the crossing distance manageable. Those are the two big factors. 
Thanks, Dan. We'll ask a couple more here before we wrap. Um, next one is from Stan Clausen, who asks, uh, do we have any experience with the surface materials at roundabouts, and is concrete better than asphalt? I don't know the answer to that, although I'll say one of my favorite uh, elements of a, a roundabout is to pay for extra pavers and other materials that uh, can do well with a added stress of it being at an angle. Uh, most roundabouts use paving uh, and they do it well. It's, it's such a forgiving material, but um, I don't I don't have an answer to that, uh, but but worthy of, of asking. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Dan. Next question is from Chance Jensen, who asks, what are the limitations of a roundabout? In what situations is a signal or sign controlled intersection more appropriate? Yeah, there are a number of intersections that are still better designed uh, with signals uh, or even a four way stop. Um, it all deals with with if you're part of a system of intersections, say you you just have uh, the complexity of pulsing uh, your your uh, traffic through roundabouts can take a, a certain amount of uh, loading, but they if if uh, the signals downstream or upstream are sending too much in at certain flows then it doesn't work. And again, this is something our engineers do with their modeling. They always take a good look at what the other intersections do. I think that's the big one. Uh, there are some areas where a roundabout just doesn't fit. And that's one reason I'm real pleased uh, that the new uh, uh, domed roundabouts uh, might fit in a space uh, that otherwise wouldn't work. For example, uh, I'm told that uh, for all modes, uh, we need 120 feet diagonally across for a single lane, right? Uh, more obviously for a two lane, but there are some areas where now I think if we do domed, uh, we can bring that number down even more. And I hope there are some good guidebooks that are already out or being put in that shows what we can do when we properly um, scale a roundabout by the design of it too to fit that, that type of a tight land constraint. I think those are the only two big ones. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Next one here's from Fred Manna, who asks, um, and actually notes that in Manhattan Beach, California, where you conducted a walking tour, yeah. we have an intersection with five traffic entry points with our main police and fire station located at one of these points. <laughs> Is there any hope for a roundabout at such a complicated intersection with fire engines? We've already designed it. <laughs> um, I'll use as an example, I think it's in uh, oh, New York, the, the town begins Glen. Um, they had a horrible five lane intersection downtown and they couldn't get anything to work. Signals didn't work well and no, no system they could dream up could. But they finally uh, designed and, and put a roundabout in and it just solved every problem in the world. Uh, is it Glenwood Springs? What's the town? Uh, anyway, that's a good example. But uh, for Manhattan Beach, we've already designed that uh, intersection, at least uh, with a photomorph. And uh, it would work beautifully. Uh, 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 just up to the town to to figure out how to go forward. Thanks, Dan. We mm -hmm. did get a follow up from Stan Clausen who mentioned uh, thanks for the shout out for the Montpelier roundabout. I pushed that to completion as planning director in 1987. All right. <laughs> there are so many heroes and heroines out there. Uh, you, you know, we're we're in a great age in engineering and. Uh, Anyone who, who proposes something new, whether it's a raised intersection or a roundabout or whatever it might be, is going to take plaque. I happen to love that, and and uh, so I'll always do it. But there are so many people that uh, that's not why they join that profession. They just want to do something that was going to be widely wildly accepted, no matter what. The interesting statistic is that before a roundabout goes in, if it's a first one in a community. 
typically 70% of people think it's the dumbest thing the city has ever done. But within uh, six weeks, and certainly within six months, 70% now feel it's the smartest thing their community ever did. So <laughs> be brave, do, do bold things. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, I guess maybe last question here is, uh, what are your thoughts on turbo roundabouts? These would cut down on the approach and splitter island widths. Are you familiar with that? I am um, not familiar with turbo, yeah. Okay. Um, one, one, one thing that I think is so important is that whatever the design is, is the principle that we need to follow. We need to get urban roundabouts, slightly a different picture with rural. We need to get urban roundabouts down to that magic 15 to 20 mile an hour entry and exit speed. If we haven't achieved that, then uh, we're, we're just not doing the right things. And again, I don't, I, I'm just not familiar with the term turbo, but good, reasonable size median islands are important. Uh, the same with the deflection path. The, the, these things are golden. You just don't violate these these core principles. Great, thanks, Dan. Well, we could definitely go another half hour with all the other remaining questions, but we'll be sure to follow up and send them to you. And uh, those of you who have been on here can uh, see Dan's uh, contact information. So I guess uh, to wrap up, Dan, uh, what kind of takeaways should we have from this conversation today? Well, the big one and the one I wanted to get across is Roundabouts are the most powerful tool that modern engineers have been able to, to implement. And the sooner we can get uh, up to that magic number that Carmel, Indiana has achieved, one roundabout per capita for every 1,000 residents, I think all of our towns should set that as their goal, their criteria. But to make them pedestrian friendly, uh, that we've our, our towns uh, are, are, are and should be for people first. The car is to be serviced, to be provided for, but not to dominate our designs. So roundabouts are one of the most powerful tools, and especially with road diets, keeping the scale of our streets right. Uh, I just can't think of a more powerful tool for an intersection than a roundabout. Then I've worked with every kind of roundabout there or every type of intersection there is. And uh, they're, they're not always the right tool, but boy, uh, too often we turn turn them down for, the, for reasons that just don't make sense. Thank you. This great. has been a great privilege for me. Great, thanks. Thanks, Dan. And I'll refer folks to our webinar archive page and YouTube channel where you can see a couple of sessions that we did with Dan in 2020 on walkability, as well as the recent webinar we did with Angie Schmidt on right of way that talked about um, how to deal with uh, issues of pedestrians and pedestrian fatalities. So with that, we are gonna conclude our webinar today, designing roundabouts to support walkability and smart growth. I'd like to offer a great big thank you to Dan Burden for a great presentation, to everyone who attended today, and to John Coleman, our communications and technology guru, who helps to make this all happen. The complete recording of today's webinar will be posted on smartgrowth.org. Also, for those of you who have requested one, all attendees will receive an email that will contain a link to a personalized certificate of participation. Please look for this follow-up email if you need the certificate to claim other continuing education credits. When you exit from today's webinar, you'll be asked to participate in a short evaluation. Please take a few moments to provide feedback so that we can continue to improve the webinar experience for you. And finally, keep an eye on smartgrowth.org and your email inbox for details on other future webinars, including the past, present, and future of electric bicycling with Carlton Reed, Dylan Fitch, and Andrew Brown, which will be held on Thursday, June 23rd. We also have another webinar before then that we'll be sending out information about soon. So thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.